Hey, Black African Power. What's good? What's happening? A well organized lie defeats a disorganized truth every time. Ooh, we, man, y'all already know what it is, man. It's God Killer in the house, man. And look, man, we got a powerful show today. And look, man, let's just get it cracking, man. I'm a rock squad up, Magi Archers in the building. Please believe. Oh, shit. Nah. If you ain't Sinetta, no time for that interview, dog. I put my shit out for niggas, I don't send it to blogs. Clan kill off the Buddha, not being discreet. One puff this big pops and projectiles. Between the sheets. Sun run, cold game, bring your cleats. The best flow blow, Eskimo, penguin feet. Don't need no blunt to burn. You run the turf with ten niggas on the block. That's a punk return. Ayo, Dolomite prototype soldier with the solar light. Saber and he hold it like he hold a mic. Golden ice spenders. Sipping on that overpriced poltergeist spirits. Ripping at the open mic. Spoke the nice lyrics like Mama move mean overnight. Golden motorbike holding on some trying shit. That nice neon kit is on it. The king's libation with exotic liqueur. The queen's vibration like a side of Shakur. A lot of the poor, imported foreign threads, they ain't got at the store. Nubian Kush, the black top pottery jars, 39% THC, the quality pure. Old rappers try to spit, ain't hot as before. It's like I'm five flights above, busting shots at the floor. Cats switch up their style when they ain't got it no more. Cause they gotta keep their product in store to feed their kids. Uh, see what that weed did? The yes man agreeing on everything we said. I smother the mic like it's the love of my life. Don't get sliced and beat with the butt of the knife. Brother polite, I say I'm animalistic. Cause I still be in the hood with my hand on my pistol. The Hebrews think I'm cannibalistic. E5 divination, channel the mystic. Audio visionary, let's play poetical pictionary. Picture me burning down your missionary. Yeah. Then I send you religion That red dot on your head That's Hindu tradition Invisible, independent, and transit shit I'll bring it all to an end With indivisible games Charles Xavier, getting your brain Mental anguish, a manifesting physical pain Wizard remains the dance in the chemical rain Breathe slow, then I'm up out of this physical plane Got military machinery that exercise Weaponized greenery Shine out of jeopardize the scenery, son Bruh, the beam can time your distance Inclines convention, stop rising with no trend line resistance. The parabolic breakout, I'm F16 with the aeronautic fake out. The God killer, the God killer, the God killer, the God killer, it's the God killer, the God killer, that's who it is. The God killer, the God killer, it's the God killer, the God killer, the God killer, the God killer, it's the God killer. Black African power was good, was happening. A well organized lie defeats a disorganized truth every time. Ooh, wait, man. Let me just get straight to it, man. So we just sit up here and New York Reggie did his thing for two and a half hours. All I want to know is, did they break the rule? Brother Reggie, that was some lethal sleeper shit right there, bro. I'm going to let you know, y'all. Based off what I heard, y'all, I'm going to say you won. But all I want to know is, did a Saho Tep and Wuja break the rule that you talking about for an hour? I just want to know. So I'm going to go ahead and defer the floor, right? I don't think you're going to make it, Reggie, but, you know, now it's our turn, right? It's our turn. Go ahead, Wuja. I want to I wanna know about this rule. Can anybody? Share some light on this rule that supposedly sunk the ship. Oh well, first uh, let me say this: um, the Reggie brother Red. First of all, you know it's it's really good and refreshing that um you know to hear uh, a presentation you know period because you know in the midst of what what you know what we used to seeing on Facebook and stuff like that is good that a, that we get to see presentations first of all. But I want to say that um, the brother Reggie's presentation 
was addressing Asar Mhotep. And he mentioned my name a couple of times. And I noticed that Reggie was very careful not to say that I didn't know grammar or the, or the rules or anything and everything. And, and uh, we both know why. But I'm going <laughs> to defer uh, over to Asar Mhotep first. And then whatever Asar Mhotep doesn't cover, then I'll come, come and, uh, you know, put the icing on everything and, and um, give everybody a nice uh, lesson in grammar. Free lesson uh, in grammar and things like that. And hopefully Reggie will be able to uh, benefit. So, uh, sorry, you know, I got this screen up. So I don't know if you have anything to share. You can share your screen. But, yeah, um, I'll share my screen. All right. So all I'll right. put it back on you. Let me share my entire screen. Um, oh, but but before, bef before you, well, you can share it. You can go ahead. Go ahead yeah. and do that. Let me just... Um, like I did with the brother Reggie, uh, I want to make sure that everyone's clear. Again, this is what the issue and question was not. All right. Does black, does the word black exist as an adjective in ancient Egyptian language? Can we find cognizant of the word of the adjective black in related African languages? Uh, nobody's disputing uh, the first point, the second point. Third point, did the ancient Egyptians use color terms to describe a person or a thing? No one's disputing that. That wasn't, that's not part of the question or an issue. Lastly, do classifiers have to be present for every attestation of a word? So none of these four points is in dispute or part of the issue or the question or the topic. So the audience, you be the judge. Did the brother Reggie talk about these four issues that are not really issues and talked about the issue at hand. So I'll leave that question on the floor, but I'm going to yield over to the brother Asar Motep. Peace, peace, peace. Um, thank you everyone again for uh, tuning in and listening. Um, I appreciate your energy. I appreciate your presence. Um, we, we heard the argument from our good brother Reggie and um, I, I have to personally say I'm disappointed um, because it's clear that he does not understand the debate and the argument. And we, we listened to two and a half hours of him dancing around the argument. And, and, but I know why that is the case. Um, and so, and this is, you know, in part based on um, some of our pri private conversations. Uh, and he will readily admit that he is not a linguist. And so um, this is a linguistic question. And so we're, we're asking about the semantics. We're asking about, can you demonstrate that in the word Kemet for the place name, the nation, the toponym, that the root of it is Kim Black versus any of the other uh, Kim roots that exist in the language. That's the question. It's simple. But because he doesn't have a background in linguistics, he can't answer that question. He doesn't have the tools to answer that question. And we saw as a result of not having that background, the dancing and talking about issues that aren't issues at all. Um, we're, we're talking about uh, semantics here. There's a whole field of linguistics called semantics. And we can include semiotics in this. And so what we, what we have here is basically like a mechanic trying to enter into a conversation on rocket science. And Reggie has stepped into an arena that is admittedly not his field. And so he doesn't have the tools, he doesn't have the whereabouts to be able to solve this problem. And so we know that this is the case, and this is the same case with our good brother Nedanev, who is in the recruitment office on his way to basic training in linguistics. He's not there yet. And so in the meantime, all they can do is appeal to authority. Well, I studied and listened to John Henry Clark and I read Dr. Ben, 
and I read Dr. Diop and I know Riketty Amin, they always name drop. You can you only name drop when you don't have the skills to stand on your own two feet. You're not mature enough in the subject that you can do that. And so there was a reason why I never addressed Ned or Ned in the first video is because I don't have to. The information stands on itself. I can I can do this without name dropping anyone because I have that skill set. And so we're going to deal with that. Um, in this uh, particular discussion. And, and I think he's unaware that I actually had two discussions after the, the discussion that we had with Ned and Ed, um, clearing up some things for some folks. And so um, shameless plug, you know, for those who uh, want to know why uh, linguistics is important um, to Africana studies, to the field of classical Africology, um, I encourage you to visit my website, www.asarimhotep.com, and sign up for uh, my Introduction to Linguistics course. Uh, in 2019, at the end of 2019, I will introduce uh, two courses on historical comparative linguistics, but you have to get the basics in linguistics first before we can go there. So, um, also with me being a computer scientist, I stress the emphasis on science. And when we're having discussions like this, there's a, a few axioms, there's a few things we always have to keep in mind when we're doing scientific work. And so um, I want to introduce to the, to the lay community this concept called reliability. And so reliability is a degree of consistency of a measure. A test will be reliable when it gives the same repeated result under the same conditions. Psychologists consider three types of consistency over, over time. That means that uh, the test to retest reliability across items, internal consistency, and across different researchers, inter uh, rater reliability. And so we're, we're going to have some discussion on reliability um, in, in terms of our instruments uh, regarding this question. Dealing with the internal consistency, and we'll see how why this is going to be important later on in our discussion. Um, internal consistency, for example, has to deal with uh, reliability within the system itself. How reliable is this measure within the system itself? And so uh, to give you a, a bit of an example here, uh, if you were to create a quiz to measure students' ability to solve quadratic equations, you should be able to assume that if a student gets an item correct, that he or she will also get other similar items correct. So you can change the appearance of a phenomenon, but if they are still right and exact, they should be able to recognize that it's the same underlying function um, to be able to solve that problem. And so it's the same thing that we're going to deal with uh, here in this in this uh, discussion here. So um, dealing with validity, it refers to the accuracy of an assessment, whether or not it measures what it is supposed to measure. Even if a test is reliable, it may not provide a valid measure. Whether the information relates to the problem or the hypothesis being investigated. So I, I mentioned earlier, you know, what the actual research question is, what the debate is. And so he's making a whole bunch of arguments that are invalid because they don't address the actual subject being discussed here. And so we'll, we'll demonstrate that um, as well. So uh, dealing with accuracy, this means that if you can find similar information in these two valid and reliable sources, then your information could be considered accurate. We, we're addressing whether the information can be substantiated in more than one reliable source. Therefore, is the information consistent with information from other reputable sources? And so this, the, this issue of accuracy, it, it, you have to proceed with caution because you can find, for example, consensus on something and they could be called, be, uh, called uh, reliable sources, but the, the foundation for which the information is argued could be wrong. For example, uh, I don't think this is a problem with anyone on the 
the uh, line right now, but there's a time where everyone, all the early sources argued that the ancient Egyptians were white people basically from Europe. And so those are reliable sources. However, the, the, the information was inaccurate. So in science, it's always about demonstration. Demonstration beats conversation. How can you determine something to be true, you know, in terms of the premise? So that's what we'll be dealing with. Can y'all hear me well? Yeah, we can hear you. Um, okay, just cool. just real quick, uh, hopefully, uh, same thing. Those uh, who are watching, if you can uh, press one, if you can hear and see uh, clearly, I just want to make sure. But uh, so you can continue. I'll just watch, see what people are saying. Okay, so <laughs> when when it comes to uh, the ancient Egyptian uh, culture and and writing script, why do you think that all of the people who deal with Egyptology in Africa also have a background in linguistics? Is that a coincidence? Why is linguistics so important to the study of ancient text in the culture? And so we have uh, a linguist and Egyptologist and theologian by the name of Madupe Odioye, who wrote a text, Words and Meaning in Yoruba Religion. Uh, the connections between uh, the Yoruba, Semitic, and Egyptian language. And on page 22, he, he, he says this. He says, any student of African beliefs or of any, this thing is blocking my, Okay, preliterate society who does not have this tool, talking about philology and linguistics, is severely handicapped. Any researcher who undervalues it does so at his own peril. For language has preserved for us the inner living history of a man's soul. Emphasized living. Language has been described as the oldest living witness to history. Without linguistic corroboration, Archaeological evidence is tantalizingly inaccurate. And here is a challenge to use Professor Idowu's uh, words. Each one of us must get to know his or our own people thoroughly and approach their belief reverently and sympathetically because we possess that which is the key to their soul, their language. So you have a lot of researchers, especially this is why the, the, the people who deal with Egyptology, the African-Americans here are so behind is because they don't have the tool of linguistics to, to make certain arguments better. And so uh, I wanted to stress this for, for the public. So I'm, this is a teaching moment. So I'm, I'm taking this time to introduce the lay public to some concepts that we have to deal with here. So um, <laughs> this is gonna be important here. The plural strokes, for example. Now, the plural strokes are often um, argued to, to or excuse me, I should just say the three strokes, which are, uh, are often defined as a plural. But it can be a plural, but in most instances, it is a classifier. It is not part of the root. And so here are a few examples of what I mean here. And you'll see why this is going to be important. So we see this word here, the jet, surf. This is a singular noun, also suffixed by the T. It's a singular noun, but we have two graphemes, a male and a seated, uh, the seated man and the seated woman, followed by the plural strokes. If we went by and argued that this was plural, this should be surfs. But that is not the case. Why is that? Same thing with this word here, um, this phrase here, remetch is that workmen. Again, a, sing a, 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 a singular man uh, classifier with the three strokes classifier, um, as well as the, uh, uh, well, this one has a singular uh, stroke in, in, in before. But to read this literally with the idea that these are always represent plural, we should, uh, render this work men, but it's not work men. It is a work man in the singular. Same thing with this conscript, 
this phrase here, Ramesh Mashai, and the same thing, Ramesh Neb, anyone, someone, somebody. Why the plural here? This is going to be important. <laughs> Here's some other words where we, we get to see some, we get to get some clarity on, on this, this plural, so-called plural stroke, uh, these plural three strokes here. So you see this, this root here, this verb, you know, eri, to adore. Then you have iru or irawa, adoration. Notice that you have the, 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 the suffix here. So you have this root and then you have this suffix, this W suffix, adoration. Now it just has a, a singular, this is a shorter version of this bottom version here, which is the longer version. Notice you have the papyrus scroll of abstract and then you have the plural strokes here. This is not a plural word, this is not adorations. This is adoration. This represents and it, and it coincides with the actual language itself, the grammar for the abstract. This W is a suffix of the abstract. Same thing here with to bring, any. And then you have enu. This is where you got the extra new here um, for production, because new is also a, a grammatical suffix uh, for the abstract. And we can demonstrate that at another time. But you see here, to bring, and then production and tribute. Abstract concepts, ideas. Same thing with hikaru, hunger. Exaltation. This is not plural words here. And this one, this is because I took this from another lesson um, from uh, our good brother, uh, Wujawu, so he has something else in mind, but I wanted to stress this. So this word heti here doesn't fall in line with this. This is for something else. But I'm showing you here that these plural strokes have to deal with abstractness. And this is a, a and this comes from a a an idea, a class of location. <clears throat> For those who, who write and actually write articles and things of that nature, we, there's several software that we use to, to bring um, the, the hieroglyphic script uh, to the forefront. And one of them is JSS. And so in the JSS software, you have the JSS editor and they'll tell you what certain glyphs, uh, what the function is, their uh, pronunciations, if they have one, and, um, and other little detailed information. So the, the Z2, that is the, 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 the classifier that we're looking at, the three strokes here. Um, the Z2 is tell you right here, it's a, a, it can be a phonogram and an ideogram. And it says here under the sign description, determinative for plural, as we noted, or the abstract. It says avoid for numbers. So you don't apply this, you know, when it comes to the numbers. Um, and so, uh, so this is the abstract. <laughs> this is important because he, he's, he showed my slide, but he didn't get into why the slide was presented. And so notice that this word Kemet here is, has the, the graphemes of the seated man and the seated woman like we saw before. And this abstract, this is not a plural. This is, has nothing to do with people. And you get that sense when you actually read the text with it in. So it was after he had ruled Egypt and after he had put the desert in his company that he came to us. It was after he had protected the two lands. That's the, the tower here. Um, and after he had pacified the two banks, it did we right here that he came to us. It was after he had caused Egypt, Kim it again, right here, to live and after he had removed its needs. It's referring in the singular, showing that this is singular, not plural, and it's referring to a place. There is no description here of people. 
And there's a reason why I have this S highlighted in red here. The way that this passage is worded lets us know that it is talking about the state as a political entity and not the Nisbe adjective form Kemetiu, those of Kemet. This is supported by the fact that Kemet is used in the same manner as all of the other political locations in the text. The name Desheret, Tawi, and Idebwi in the original text does not employ personal determinatives. Furthermore, after the second sentence containing the word Kemet, it refers back to the word Kemet by means of a third person singular feminine suffix pronoun, it's. If it spoke about the people, we would expect sin, their, they, them, not it. So we want to talk about grammar and grammar rules, but he never wants to examine the actual word in the actual sentence and how the other grammatical features in the sentence reaffirms the place of the word in the sentence. So this has nothing to do with people in the sense of this uh, allegedly um, describing the, the classifiers. That's not how classifiers work. And, and, and you can tell that our brother is handicapped and he's old and he's still dealing with old, outdated stuff because he doesn't understand what a classifier is and its functions of a classifier. These are class, this is a class language. And the classifiers are a result of it being a class language. It's telling you what class it belongs to, the nation, the abstract concept of a nation. There's nowhere you can interpret this as plural or people. It's not talking about the inhabitants of the nation. So we'll continue and now and I'll have another. So of course, when we talk about the classifiers, I say that these are the earliest renditions of the word Kemet. And in linguistics, we have this concept called a minimum pair. This is how we can distinguish one word from another um, in the language. And now I'm going to have a whole separate presentation on the 049 glyph and why the 049 glyph is actually another form of the irrigated land glyph. And this has to deal with water. But I'm not going to get too much into that. I don't need to. But you can see just how we do minimum pairs in linguistics, we could do minimum pairs with classifiers. And if we can substitute one classifier for the other and the meaning of the word does not change, that that means these two concepts interchange. This is important. <clears throat> As we've already discussed 100,000 times, which no one addresses, is that Kemet is a toponym and never refers to a place. Now, it's interesting that, um, that they bring up Diop's arguments because Diop is arguing that it has nothing to do with Black land, that it has to do with Black people. But they're trying to argue it's both. So they're going against Diop the same way that I'm allegedly going against Diop. Because Diop doesn't argue for Black land. He argues against Black land. But that's another topic for another day. And so, again, here are some toponyms, uh, classifiers, you know, in the languages. And so the, the concept of determinative is becoming um, weighing out because the concept of a determinative does not accurately describe what the classifiers are. So there's a whole there's there's a whole bunch of literature on Egyptian classifiers um, now. And so, you know, our good brother Reggie needs to. Uh, update his research. So now, <laughs> the reason why the classifiers are, are very important is because it tells you what class the word belongs in. It, it does, the, there's no um, it, it qualifying anything. Um, it, it, it's, I'm going to have to wait on that full lecture because you'll just have to see it from the raw text and the, the literature uh, in Egyptology. So you, you can tell that he really doesn't keep up with Egyptological literature because he doesn't really present at Egyptological conferences. He doesn't publish in these things. So he doesn't have to keep up with this stuff. And so this word, this D3 glyph is, is the quintessential 
uh, classifier for blackness. And it tells you, and, and it goes by several different um, pronunciations because they're, each pronunciation focuses on a different concept within the word. So you'll see this as the sole ideogram for the word in wound for complexion, color, nature, disposition, skin of a man or animal. It's also in the word for character, reputation, and the cognate for this in um, Chiluba is Chikuma, characteristic uh, character for this word here. And I go through the sound uh, correspondences in the text. So we can see, as we know, the word Kim, that means black, suffered, I mean, uh, terminated by this classifier. And so Kemet, the black woman Isis, here's the source. And so I'm just letting y'all know that this is a color uh, determinative or uh, classifier. And so here's another one, the N33 glyph. And you can see it in these words here for black eye paint or red color of plants. Now, there's a reason why this is important here. The Egyptians don't have many words for color. If you study African languages and African people in general and, is, and study their color terms, you'll come to find out that they don't have words in their language for color as an abstract concept. They are all referencing a particular object that is a, a, a good general representation of that color. Is somebody trying to say something? No, you're good. Okay, okay, okay. I thought I heard something. So that's why the word for flamingo is the word for red. And why red is typically um, terminated by this classifier. But in a general sense, also classified by the N33. Same thing with blue, same thing with yellow. But what they're saying here is that, for, for example, if I said uh, red paint, I'm saying that this paint is the color of the flamingo. That's how you would say it in the language. Same thing with white here. You notice this is terminated by the sun. This is talking about bright white light. And the color for green is the representation of plants. And then when they want to talk about it abstractly, they use the N33. And so the same thing with the uh, color for black. It has to deal with hair. It's the color of hair. That's why this is the representation of it. And so notice that each one of these um, colors are the representation for the most part, um, at least the ones that have, um, how should I say, the, um, the, the, the pictorial classifiers of the actual object itself. And so this is the word, so we're saying here that this word Kim is actually also the word for hair in the language. And then there was a sound shift and something, uh, there was a sound shift in the language and it became um, a different uh, uh, pronunciation later on going into the, the mid old kingdom, going into the middle kingdom. And so <laughs> here's a, a, another bit of information that's gonna be very important in this, con in this context. And so this is from um, Goldwasser's article on why classifiers, title why classifiers are important. And so this is a whole article. She's written whole books. There's a whole school of people, uh, especially in the German, uh, the, the German Egyptologists and, and things of this nature. She's actually from Israel that talks about these classifiers. And so I just want to, uh, yeah, I'll just read this whole thing. So in many cases, the classifier directs the reader to specific aspects of the knowledge structure and the end product of the reading process is a highlighted frame of knowledge. In many cases, this extra information relays socio-cultural or institutional perceptions. This knowledge is attached to individual nouns themselves 
and is usually not context sensitive. For example, in the word widow, the two classifiers, the last two signs right here, highlight two aspects of widowhood. The first is the hair glyph, the D33, is a metonymic classifier, is a cultural referent referring the reader to mourning rituals in ancient Egypt, in which women's hair played an important role. The second classifier refers to a universal generic classification of the widow, which is not culture bound, but a universal semantic feature of the lexeme, widow. Therefore, a widow is a kind of female, thus. So this is the cultural aspect, and this is just the generic um, classifier to let you know um, what, what um, uh, this deals with. So we know that the, uh, the, the falling hair has to deal with widowhood culturally in ancient amongst the ancient Egyptians. And so this classifier functions in a way like a female gender marker. Okay. So continue. In another spelling of the word, the hair classifier is replaced with the bad bird, while the same gender classifier is used at the end. This classifier, which originally designated the category small, acquired the extended meaning negative from the, the Middle East, uh, Kingdom onwards. Camerzel correctly, uh, Camerzel correctly defined the use of this classifier in the New Kingdom as a non-iconic classifier constituting a hypercategory of events that states which were regarded as negative or undesirable. So just like with our minimal pairs that I, I spoke of earlier, which I'm gonna have a whole presentation on, these operate as minimal pairs because they, they both in this context designate something negative. Let's continue. So I want to demonstrate that the, the, the D3 hair glyph was pronounced Kim. And so we have records in personal names. And this is the source. For example, BB Kim and Behez Kim. BB, this is the glyphs here, the foot glyphs for B, and Behez. And these are Kim. So this helps to demonstrate that the word that this is Kim. So the, the concept of black being associated with the hair is a direct consequence of the word, the, the original uh, pronunciation of this glyph being Kim. Why is this important? Because the concept of Kim blackness derives from the color of the hair. <laughs> now, let's, let's do some linguistics, that unimportant stuff that, that Reggie wants to skip over. So in language, remember that ancient Kemet as a political state, the unification of the two lands, existed well over 3,000 years. In 3,000 years, you develop dialects. And even though they're using a single script, the dialectical forms of words are going to make themselves known. And as a matter of method, how can we tell when something is a dialectical variant? Because we can we can put the uh, we can create a set, and we're going to use set theory here. We create a set of corresponding words and the sound correspondences to the um, to the far right in the far right column. So you have Kemet here, complete I. Then you have Gemhach, I, to catch sight of, Gemi, to find, to discover. One thing about the ancient Egyptian language is first is monosyllabic. And anything past two consonants in, in sequence is a grammatical morphine. You only know this if you study linguistics and you pay attention to the script. And so this W is another variation. So this is a partial reduplication and the M becomes W. This informs us that there were two vowels in between and uh, uh, surrounding this uh, M. So it became W. It's a process called lenition. So Sakim Kim, destruction, annihilation. This S is a nominalizer. This is not a, a causative prefix. This is a nominalizer. This is the original so-called feminine T in the language. We deal with that in the book. And so the verb here 
uh, Gim Gim to smash, to break, to tear. Kim, duty, profit, Gim, invoice, sum, account. Kimmy Yit, food, Gim, produce, product. Again, the W, because of the two vowels, weakens it. And this other suffix here uh, gives it a different connotation for bread. So a mineral, kimu, a mineral, a kimat, special shaped stone as part of a doorway. And you can see that they both have the same classifiers. I just don't have the, the glyphs up here. And so kimu, also a substance and medical. Uh, kimiet, a herd of cattle. Gu, a bull. Kimiet, a jar. Ginnet, a jar. And so M and N interchange in uh, Egyptian. Why is this important? <laughs> because here is a cognate a dialectical variant of the word Kim for hair. So you have Gimehet here, lock, hair braid, temple. Notice again that the, 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 the word here can also deal with the word for widow. So Gimehet, widow, and also the same classifier at the end. So we just read that from the, uh, the one source here. And so <laughs> I want to highlight because I, I spoke in um, a, a, another lecture and, and I've had this conversation with Brother Reggie about um, repetition. We, 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 when we was dealing with the concept of reliability and uh, it has to deal with the repeatableness and internal validity. This is, this is where all this stuff comes into play. And so this word here, jihad, cold black, See, people say coal black and think that the word means uh, comes the, the blackness comes from coal. That's not the case at all. It says clearly here, coal black from the hair, just like the other black chem coming from hair. This is the in the German um, uh, dictionary. Schwarz vom Haar, vom from Haar, from the hair, coal black. So it's telling you that the word, the hab, Jahab for black, the other word for black in the language comes from the hair. And from this, then you get blackness concept of blacken uh, with charcoal. But it's not from charcoal itself, it's from hair, from the hair. And we know that this root here, remember what I said, if you have a, a for example, a so-called triliteral, two of the word, two of the uh, consonants are going to be the root. And the third one, whether it's a prefix or a suffix, uh, is going to be the grammatical morphine. So this j is the grammatical morphine. We know because we have a different variant of the word where it's now prefixed by uh, I, or this variant of Y or the J, if you want to say, uh, and also suffixed by W. It's a sign of mourning, which means loosened or unkept hair. So the root has to deal with hair, not coal. The, with the prefix, it has other connotations. So this becomes important for the, the other work. So now we, we have demonstrated that Kim means hair. And so it explains why the other pronunciation for Kim is Shin, because Shin is a other dialectical variation of the word Kim. And how can we prove this? Demonstration beats conversation. So we have Kim hair, shinny hair, Kimmy a snake, shinech a snake, Kim a vessel, shinny a vessel, Kimmy yet cattle, shin relating to cattle, Kim perform work, shinny a workman. This is a, uh, uh, a, a, a nominalizer here and, and one dealing with human beings. And the other variant is W, Kim to pay, shinu tax audit. The suffix W here of abstraction. Ik, ikim, shil. This prefix is a, um, is a grammatical morphine uh, dealing with uh, instruments. It's a, it's a classifier in the language for instruments. Shinny, the root to block. And then kim, the crocodile tail. And then shin, crocodile. And so this is provable. And I don't have to go through our formulas again. Because I don't have to do a math lesson for folks. Now we can go into other languages to help prove some things. So I go into Chiluba, and we can see here that 
this word because kemet also means a dorsal fin and a, and a and a uh a an aspect of the crocodile uh, of uh, it is pertaining to the the god sebek and we can see in uh chiluba bantu in congo the cognate for it so k has palatalized and become s and m corresponds with l in the second consonant position here so it's fin flipper kim service duty work sala to do and this is also a word for work kim to pay sela to pay dowry for a wife kim in egypt musulu river brook stream we'll get into that in a moment but notice the classifier this is the word for canal or river so that's why we have um this here kim to complete uh, to put to an end, to put an end to sulu to be finished completed, uh, kusala to, at the end the to the point of the limit of the boundary of the border edge, breach shore coast, and so ku is a locative prefix here. So sakem to bring to an end to to find out and then sudisha, and so I'm showing that the same grammatical. Um, uh, affixes are are, are in the same roots here. And so this is going to be very important. So I've already established with Chiluba, and, and I've already established in some other um, presentations that uh, Egyptian K corresponds to Chiluba K in the first consonant position. And I'm showing here now that it also corresponds to S. But I want to show this more so to show the second consonant position that the M corresponds to L in the second consonant position. And so this D is an allophone. So it's a, it's a rule in the language. When, uh, when L is followed by I, L turns into D. That's what this formula says here. When L is followed by I, L turns into D. So <laughs> with that said, she come in, uh, this is what I call Egyptian, uh, the Kim, the crocodile tail, is also Mukila in, um, e, 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 in Chiluba for tail of an animal or reptile. These are cognates. So when anybody's trying to, I'm doing all of this to demonstrate what the methods are to prove what the root is. So uh, of, of the glyphs. So we're, we're dealing with the glyphs now and, and, and showing that the crocodile tail, this is not charcoal. And so I, and there's people still, this is what a Diop's arguments that this is charcoal. And to Diop's credit, he got this from the war to bush. And we can, I can demonstrate why that is incorrect. Um, but this is clear as day is the crocodile tail. And so I get into this concept, um, you know, taking a uh, lead, for example, in this root, uh, this article, Egyptology and the Social Sciences. Um, my bad, this uh, book, Egyptology and the Social Sciences. We must, of course, be prepared to look for attribute clusters that are very different from those of our own culture and poses. To do this, we should not assume that one example of a representation with the term X above, it is adequate information for the translation of that term. We must collect as many examples as possible and try to identify the significant attributes those examples share of the category they are intended to represent. Only then will they be able to predict the boundaries of the category and to seek an English terminological label for it. So when we do this, when we look at the Kim glyph, we know that is a dorsal fin referring to Sebek, the crocodile deity. Kim in, that's why they only focus on the end of the glyph. So that same glyph represents the concept in. There's no black in. <clears throat> um, and then, of course, with it being a crocodile and then with the crocodile tail. And so we just, uh, I showed the, that this is uh, cognate within the, the language itself for a crocodile. And so, um, and of course we can go into Chiluba with the sound laws that we've already established for fin flipper. And, I, and I'm saying that there's a theme going on here. Musalala, main. And so Kim hair, and this is another variation of the word Kemet. And so I showed that in the first and second video, um, the sound correspondence is here. Main of a baboon. Shisala, branch with its leaves, twigs, and flower. And you'll notice that in the Egyptian language, the same root, the words for hair, there's many different words for hair. They also double as words for uh, plants and trees. 
because there's an underlying theme here. There's a, these are attribute clusters. And, and, and Shiluba helps to, to uh, clarify this um, because the root has to deal with to spread, to disperse, to spread out uh, of the termite nest. This is where the L turns into N, spread, expand, and here's another variation to disperse. So it's talking about something that points out, basically occurs from a center. So that's why it can refer to the tail, why it can refer to hair, and a fin and flipper, because this is the underlying theme for the word, which is why you don't dismiss linguistics when you're having conversations about ancient Egypt. And so <clears throat> I bring up again the semantics, the concept of a semantics, and why the when you're doing comparisons, you have to understand how words are derived in the language. And so the word Kim for black comes from the word Kim for hair. That's all it is. It's the color of the hair, the generic um, symbol for, for, for hair. Uh, it has to deal with blackness. And so when we go into the Sumerian language, they have a different word for black, which comes from a different root. And I just want to show that the semantics, that the, the words for colors come from the, the words for things. And we can find this all across African languages. So we have, for example, essi and esh, you know, a tree, a tree, a tamarif almond tree. This word gig, a tree, a resin, gigi, gigi, to be black, mess, a tree, mess, blackness, black spot, black wood, mosh, ngesh. And this is an ng sound. And so I, I, I note here that the sh sound and the s sound in Sumerian interchange. Also the ng sound and the m as in Mary interchange, as we can see. So this word, word here is just a variant of this word here, gesh, um, for tree. And so the words for blackness in Sumerian comes from the word for tree, not for hair, like in Egyptian. So when you're doing comparative linguistics, you always have to first find the root for which derivative words form. So we're dealing with um, the folly of our good brother Nedunev. And so he tried to go to the Dogon languages. And so the Dogon languages, their word for hair is kuro. But their word for um, black and dark colored is Jim, a Jimme, or Gim, in some other estimation, Jimbu, become black, make black. And notice that you, in order to say a black person, you have to put a uh, the word for person in front of it, just like in Egyptian. So if I want to say black person, you know, or black people, I have to say Remetch, you know, Kim. And so it's the same here, Guzu Jimme. For example, Gusu Jume, Gusu Jim, black skinned person. So these are not cognates in the language, they're not the same word. So when Ned or Neb goes and, and says that Jim here is a cognate for Kim in um, Egyptian, he is wrong because he doesn't know the comparative method, he doesn't know how to do it. And so these are just the other dialects. And so I've been dealing with Dogon for quite a while. I have all the Dogon dictionaries. And so I just pause this so you, you know, for folks can pause and they can read this stuff on their own. <laughs> so I already did the, uh, I won't go through it again here, but I already proved that the word itself, Kim and Kemet, that the root has to deal with water. And there was a process that we did that. And I matched it all three in different languages. And so I used Sumerian and Chiluba, and they match in every form. So the cognate of Kemet in Sumerian is Kiduru. And we know that this is the roots to be soft, to be wet, to be irrigated, damp, fresh. Um, and with the key prefix, a so-called feminine T here, um, it, 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 
it nominalizes it and gives it a secondary meaning. So now you have damp ground, irrigable land. This is the meaning of the word Kemet. And we're gonna show some other variations of the word Kemet. Because remember that Egypt is over 3,000 years old. And because it's over 3,000 years old and there's thousands of miles, hundreds of miles, as far as the Nile Valley is concerned, that you develop different languages and dialects. And so this is all going to come to a head real soon. So you, you were talking about, for example, on Ghana, but you don't understand where this concept comes from. Why didn't you post the sound correspondences? These are the sound correspondences that inform us that the a cognate for the word Kemet in Bantu languages, besides Kim, and I can show that as well, is Chiyankanda. This is in Chiluba. And so since all the Bantu languages are related, this varied form of the words are all the same. So it has to do with a piece of land, a field, part of a field being plowed in a day. This has to do with irrigatable land. So this is the slide that he was saying. So when you when you have the confirmation in the other languages, this is how you can demonstrate that the word itself means what it means in the language. Because we've done the proper method. We didn't assume anything. We let the evidence speak for itself. And so in the Herero language, Oinganda village, and also properly a new passage with abundance of grass and water. This is just one variation. So this is what I show here. I'll let this pause. Again, I'm trying to, I'm gonna rush over the stuff that already been covered. And, um, and so these are, and, and I base this on sound laws. So these are different variations of the word Kim in the actual ancient Egyptian language. And they all share the same classifiers. And so if you don't know linguistics, you don't know how to prove anything dealing with linguistics. This is semantics. It's a linguistic field. It's a linguistic endeavor. If you don't know linguistics, you don't toss your hat in the ring. You are out of your league when it comes to this subject. <laughs> and so I already uh, demonstrated this is a riparian zone. This is what a Kemet deals with. A land with a large amount of water and a river running through it that floods. A riparian zone or riparian area is the interface between land and a river or a stream. A riparian is also the proper nomenclature for one of the 15 terrestrial biomes of the earth. Plant habitats and communities along the river margins and banks are called riparian vegetation, characterized by the hydrophilic plants. Riparian land refers to terrain that is adjacent to rivers and streams and is subject to periodic and occasional flooding. Everyone who knows anything about Egypt knows the importance of the, the now flood to the survival of the people. We're talking about the flood plains here. And keep this flood in mind, because we're gonna deal with something real quick. So remember that I said that there's multiple variations of the word Kemet in the actual uh, language uh, or the actual script, the Session Metanetra script. And so I argue here that the word Ta Mary is a dialectical, actually it comes from another language because there's multiple languages being spoken in Kemet. Multiple, this is the other language variation of the word Kim. How can we prove it? Again, demonstration beats conversation. So we have this word Miri, to love, to wish. And in Chiluba, we have comma. And so what I'm arguing here is that the M corresponds with M, as we demonstrated before in other um, uh, lectures, and in the main one dealing with uh, Nedarneb, and that this R corresponds with K. We can do this in Egyptian itself. I just want to prove something. So everywhere you see mer, the syllabic inverse in Chiluba is KM in terms of the consonant sequence. So to love, to wish, comma, to love, to desire, to wish, to think. Meru, desert, 
this suffix of place, comma, dry up, evaporate. This is the verb. This nominalizes the verb. Myrrh, weaving, kuma, spinning, making thread, making fabrics, weave. Merit, divine songstress personified. Ngimba, singer, chanter, professional singer. Merit, a black cow. Ngomba, cow, beef, livestock. This, it may be a black cow, it may not, but the cognates have no color reference here. It's just a cow or, or bull or whatever. Meru or Mirawa, cedar. And you see other variations of this word. Meri, pole, partisan um, supporter. Mukamba, and also variant Mutamba, bean or timber. So we have established they, a, the sound correspondences. This is, this is not up for debate. So R corresponds with G and K in this position. It also corresponds with J or Y in Chiluba. So Mur, lake, canal, Jijiba, pond, lake, fish. And the same way that M and B correspond or interchange in Egyptian, it does the same thing in Chiluba. And remember what I said earlier about the, the, uh, the Bs or Ms turning to W in between two vowels. So in this case, it's two back vowels. So merit a boat, a barge, is majua, mazua, boat, ship, ocean liner in Chiluba. Mer, tomb, pyramid, jijambu, jijamu, tomb. Meriti, two urea snakes. Jinga, coil, wind up, surround. And I show how the word for snakes has to deal with the word for coil. Mer, love, wish, desire. Jinga, desire, wish, to be necessary. So you have different dialectical variations um, of these words. And so I'm just showing you the sound correspondences. We're setting up something here. <laughs> We've already established that M, I mean, uh, that the R corresponds to K in initial position in Chiluba. But I just wanted to, we already gave one example of the M and B. And so we always have to have three or more to, to show a pattern. So these two show this pattern. So Mer, bundle of clothing, Jikuba, bundle, package. Um, well, I don't have package here twice. Uh, and bundle. I don't know why I have that here twice. Anyway, Jibuki, bundle, parcel, bunch, package, baggage. So you see that even in the in Chiluba, the syllables interchange or, or inverse. So mer love again, Kuba, protect, take care of, make sure, monitor, observe. And, and I go into how all of that um, in, in the text. So there's some text under here, but I just want to give you these correspondences um, for now. So when we have, for example, Ta Mary. <laughs> We've already established that that the M corresponds with the the mer corresponds with K. Excuse me, the the mer corresponds with Kim. Um, the sequence in Chiluba, and it does so also in um, Egyptian. But I just wanted to point out this is from the Warchabush here, and this is for the word Tameri. And notice this classifier here. This is the word Tur for time and season. Why would this classifier be here for myrrh, which is, you know, has to deal with the canal, not the beloved land. That's another forced um, definition. But when we actually go and do the work, we understand this has, to, this has to deal with water, which is why you have this classifier here for a time and season, because they took time they, took, uh, they told time by the stars, the position of the sun, and the flooding of the Nile. And so you can see, I should have put a, um, a, a circle around here, the different variations of the word Tameri. And also the alternative um, classifiers at the end here. So this is a pool of water. And as I'm going to show in a different lecture, the 049 glyph has to deal with water. So when uh, Brother Reggie showed that old, old kingdom text of the uh, Kimitiu, 
it was terminated by 049, the water glyph, the irrigated land glyph. And so uh, I give Brother Reggie props for finding that. It still doesn't prove your point. But, you know, uh, I do I do give you that. So that, that was a good one. So now, <laughs> so this is in the Wartebush. This is directly a scan from the Wartebush Dictionary. It was handwritten uh, by Ehrman and Grapphall. And so we know that Mer, uh, Tom Mary has to deal with water by the classifiers and by this other class of these classifiers here and this other classifier here dealing with season and floods. And so in Chiluba, we also have other correspondences. And so, um, for example, Mer to die is Longa to die. So the R corresponds with L and the M corresponds with Ng. And so we represent that with the IPA symbol here, ng. Mer to bind, to attach, jinunga, from lunga, bind, connect, fold, a thing unto itself, make ends meet. Gifts, offerings. This is an R sound, and this is the M that, um, that became W as a result of in, existing in between two vowels. And so gifts, offering, jinunga, jinunga, Gift to pay for uh, work performed on a charm mate. So this is key here, myrrh, pasture, garden, myrrh, canal. And so in Proto-Bantu, we have longa, low-lying, wet ground. In West Savannah, it has evolved in the same way that it has evolved in Egyptian. For longa, river, as this pasture garden has also corresponds with canal and river in the, uh, in the Egyptian language. And so we're showing how the comparative method reaffirms certain things in Egyptian. And so we've already established, you know, uh, by, the, by the sound correspondences. So this, when we have Ta Mary here, this is the word Kemet. These are cognates, are different um, language variations of the same words. So you have Meret. The black cow. Then you have Kemet, black bovines. You have myrrh, bull. Then you have Kemet here, uh, black, the serapium. But this is the suffix. This is the word Kem for bull. But notice that this isn't a black bull. It's just bull. And so this is what I mean by, um, and, and we can show that a lot of Egyptologists kind of force meanings. And so if we want to, to prove the meanings of certain words, we can just go into their dialectical variations. So when people say, you, you're quoting me, but you didn't quote my, uh, my full arguments when they had to deal with Kim Wer. And so I, like a, a, a number of other African scholars who write in, uh, in, in French, are in agreement that Kim Wer has nothing to do with Black. It is a title. And so I showed you the other dialectical variation, Gim word. And it's, that's what you quoted me, but you didn't show what the meaning was. And so we have Kim word, a great black one, Osiris, but the dialectical variant is just Mer word, Menevis bull. So when we say Kim word, the region of the bitter lakes, they, they often define this as the great black lake. What logic is that? Because the dialectical variation dealing with another lake is Lake Mororis, Murwer. Because Kim has to deal with water in this instance. And so we have Kimmy, a snake, a black desert cobra, and you have Murwer, a great black, uh, which is a snake. But there's no Mur black in the Egyptian language. If it is black, it is a coincidence. Because the word mer does not mean black in Egyptian. And so when you find the cognate for it within the language, it doesn't, you don't interpret this. No one says uh, Ta Mary, the black Mary, or, or, or the, uh, the black, this would literally be the black land. And nobody argues for the black people when you talk about Ta Mary. Why? Because there's no indication, there's nothing here that would indicate that this, you know, saying means black people. And it's the same thing with the word Kemet. 
And so this is why we don't skip over linguistics. <clears throat> this is the word Mary beloved and it's dialectical variation, I be to desire to wish. B's and M's interchange in Egyptian and so does this nasalizer bular trill and this R sound here. These are from two different languages. There was multiple languages spoken in Egypt. And so you have code switching in the actual script. And so you notice a common theme when they talk about beloved. Why is the man pointing to his mouth? Because love has to do with two things. It has to do with, with, with what you tell folks, but it more so has to deal with feeding. I have a whole book. The first printing was in uh, the ebook version was in 2013, and then I released a hardcover, uh, well, not hardcover, the uh, the print version in 2015 called "Where Is the Love? How Language Can Reorient Us Back to Love's Purpose." I talk about this word here, and how the word for love has to deal with feeding, and how the word "maat" has to deal with feeding. That's another conversation for another time. But people aren't being rigorous they're being lazy they just assume things and don't have ways to prove it so there's another cognate for the word kemet or the word kim and kemet and this is going to be kind of devastating here so <laughs> here i have three columns so i have egyptian one dialect here and Egyptian, another dialect here. And of course, Chiluba to reinforce some things. So we've already went through certain of these sound correspondences with the exception of this nya right here. But this is just another variation of G. It's a palatalized J or J. So nya. So this is how we write it in IPA. But so when we transliterate these glyphs, this is lowercase a lowercase m as the root for all these in this column. And this is km, the sequence here, <laughs> with the exception of this last one. We already proved that k and g uh, uh, interchange in Egyptian. So this is just, just a dialectical variation of, of a, in, uh, a km root that just didn't come into the language. So we have hamu, this is a ha sound kind of a guttural H. Well, all H's are kind of guttural, but this is a real hard guttural H. So you say ham, hamwa, a very juicy fruit. Hamir, a plant, a very juicy uh, fruit. Kimu, seeds or fruit of the kim plant. Hamu, a food. Kimu, food. Hamir, beer jug. Kemet, a jar. Ham ham, a container for bread. Nyungu, pot jug. Chingulu, great pot jar. Hamir, turn sour, spoil, go bad. Sakim Kim, destruction. Gim Gim, crush, smash, to tear. This doesn't seem like they relate until we go into Chiluba. Inyanga, damage, destroy, deteriorate, spoil, defile, mess up, abuse, maltreat. So the concept of spoiling is just a form of destruction and deterioration. So this is why these are cognates. And so we have the, the M turning into W in this variation, to rot, to spoil. Why? Because of the process of lenition. Two vowels. Nyunga is spoiling. Nyunguku, uh, nyunguka, I should say. Nyunguka, uh, spoiling. Hama, virgin. Yima, jima, virgin. Ham, something that makes noise. Mukuma, Report, noise, sound of a gun. Ham ha ha, kernel of grain. It's a partial reduplication. Chemet, grain or a plant. Chitungu, and, and I go into the text where I show that these also, because usually it's from K, parallelizes to T, and then from T to R or S. So that's how, that's the flow, how we get the myrrh, you know, uh, correspondences um, for Kemp. So uh, hamha, a kind of beer, um, no correspondence here, but G, this, this J comes from G. And this is just a different variation. So in gym, a kind of beer, um, but I won't count this. 
um, in, in our, our presentation. So Musela, beer, malt, uh, to smear here, kanga, close, seal, jiba, and this also means to close as well. And ham ham to rub, gim gim, finger to caress, kula. So we see here that ham, this root, corresponds repeatedly to km. Why is this important? Oh, before we go there, I just want to show again that the M corresponds to W. And so these are dialectical variations of the same word, which you can see clear as day here. So, and because this is going to be important, that this W for this word is just a, an allophone, a, 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 a variant, a phoneme of this word here. So when we have the word hamahet, mud, muddy, muddy ground, this is cognate with the word kem. We already established in the other languages. So here in Chiluba, chikama, damp ground. Sumerian, kiduru, damp ground, irrigable land. All based on the science and the sound laws. And this corresponds here. So notice, and anybody who does, uh, uh, who deals with the hieroglyphs, what does the single stroke behind a glyph mean in the language? Can you can you intervene real quick, uh, Brother Rujaru? What does a single stroke behind a glyph mean? If you're still listening. Oh, well, I'll just keep on going. <laughs> what this means, you probably went to get something to drink or you're in the bathroom. So what this means is that you take this glyph literally. So remember that the uh, this glyph here, the N23, is a irrigated land glyph. This is wet land. So it says mud or muddy ground. That's the English translation. And so the cognates of it, because these are cognate with Kemet, and we already uh, showed how these are cognate with Kemet. But notice, when you actually go into the water bush, it has this word here, or this phrase here, art. Acher Bolden, kind of arable soil. That's what this is. Why you have irrigated land as a classifier for this word here. This is another dialectical variation of the word Kemet. And so the, the proper way to interpret this is the alluvial soil, which is a fine grain fertile soil deposited by water flowing over floodplains or in river beds. That's what this word here is. So this word is cognitive with Kemet. It's a partial reduplication. So this is a shortened version. Here is the full version. It's, it's reduplicated twice. So why is so when I say that Kim has to deal with water and moisture, we already proved it in Chiluba. We already proved it in Sumerian. We can prove it again in Egyptian by this word here. Moisten has to do with wetness and a cognate shishima, humidity, freshness, coldness. And so this is why um, Brother Reggie totally avoided all the linguistic arguments because he doesn't know about linguistics and he can't prove anything linguistically. So when our good brother Nedanev <laughs> you know, I, I appreciate the 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 everyone want to help him out, brother Reggie, sending him some information. Uh, so he gives you deference right here uh, uh, when you're talking about Ramech Kim, black person. Notice you have to you have to uh, uh, put this after the word for person. Yet you, you have to use the word Kim as black to describe the person. You couldn't just say Kim in Egyptian and it means black person. And so, you know, our good brother, Dr. Cambone, sends him some more information from the Ebers Papyrus. What do we have here? Hamat, Hamahat. 
Kim meant. And so this T in Kemet is not like Kemet in um, uh, the nation, the toponym. That's because this is a feminine and the adjective has to agree with the, uh, with the noun in, in terms of the gender of the noun. So this T comes from this T. So Hamahat Kemet. So black mud or black soil. So in order for them to talk about black soil, they have to use the word, this is cognate with Kemet. This is the other word Kim in Kemet. So they have to use another word to describe the color of it because this Kim is not cognate with this word here. And so this is why we're not, we, we strive not to be sloppy in our analysis. And so our good brother Ned and Neb, again, he doesn't know linguistics. He doesn't know these things. So it, it, he gets a few pointers from our good brother Reggie and Dr. Cambone, and he can't defend himself. And so this word here is the word Kemet. Let's continue. So <laughs> notice that when it comes to, so we already read one version of this. And remember, we, we demonstrated that this is an abstract, not a plural classifier here. That Brother Reggie doesn't go into the text that actually has the one that they're arguing has the word uh, Kemet, meaning black people. And so here's another variant of this word Kemet with the people classifiers and the abstract classifier. But let's read the sentence. He came. This is the word for come, past tense, him. He. He came. He calls the nation of Kemet to live. This is, you can't, this is not Kemet to you to live. He dispelled its afflictions. You see that S again? Remember that S we were introduced to before? This is a singular. This is not plural. This is not a collective, as people try to uh, argue, like a collective plural. This is no. This is, this is a singular concept. And the grammar, for all you grammar rule people, is that the grammar reinforces that this is um, a, a singular. And so the S pronominal suffix on the word shinu is a third person feminine singular pronoun. It anaphorically refers back to its antecedent. What does this refer to? This, which is the word kemet and agrees with its gender and number, which is feminine singular. The word kemet in this text is not feminine plural and would not be rendered Kemet Wilt or the, or the made up Kim Tu. This is some madness that Ned or Ned made up. And so this is from the hymn to uh, Sin Were Set, um, um, plate three, line five. <laughs> so in this variation, we're, we're you know, we, we kind of skip over things when we're talking about the grammar so here's a translation. This has come from Golan's text. So then I and the entire force descended to the black land without there being any retreating of any follower or the death of a great person or a little person. I reaching the black land safely because of my skill in ascending to this place. What place? You see this word here, set? This is the word for place. So this is ascending to place. And so we put in parentheses, this place. What place are they talking about? Kemet as a place. They're not describing people. This is a location, it's a toponym. And so toponyms describe places. And in the actual Egyptian text, it's telling, it's telling you it's a place in plain Egyptian, set, place. 
ascend this place, place right here, this word set. There's a reason why Reggie didn't read all of this. He tried to skip over and talk about something he's not qualified to talk about. And so, um, I forgot to put the source here, but this is from the Taylor Sanuhe. I think it's line 54 or something like that, 34 or 54. <laughs> so, we have the word remetch kemet. In T-U, M, the people of Kemet who are there. The people of Kemet who are. This is those, this is uh, those who are one who, but when you have the, the Nisbi and the plural here, it's those who. This is what the, this is the graphene for T-U. And then M, I am right here, or J M or Y M if you're using a German transliteration system, is a word for there. What is there? What is there referring to? This place. You can only reference Kemet as a place. Never is it describing any people. And so this is why we go into the text. And so we we get this is why. I, Reggie wasted two and a half hours talking about who he shake hands with. I shake Jordan's hands one time. Does that mean I could dunk from the th um, the, the the three point line because I I, I knew it was associated with somebody? No. We only deal with primaries here, <laughs> and so let's use the logic. Let's go to logic real quick. <laughs> so. This is from the um, uh, the the dictionary for the coffin text, and we have a a a locative here, the, the place name, <laughs> and notice the the glyph because this is the word for fish. This is haret, a haret. It's a word for fish. And so this is a quote unquote fish known. If we use Diop's logic and we place this series of graphemes after the, 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 the name here, the word for fish, would you translate this word to as the fish qualifying the noun? So that means these are fish people, that they, they look like fish. Is that what you're arguing? If we substitute this, the 049 glyph, with this, does this mean that these are fish people? No. And so this is where that validity, consistency, and all that comes in. So once you take it outside of Diop's argument for Kemet, and you try to apply that same logic somewhere else in the language using the same rules, it doesn't fly. And so this is why um, we, as scientists, we investigate everything. We're not going against Diop, just an argument of his and every other Egyptologist. And y'all making this about Diop. This is about Egyptology, period. And so it was just a lot of mischaracterization uh, going on uh, as far as uh, our good brother, you know, saying is concerned. Hold on, let me, I, I, I'm not even gonna go into the, these German texts, but notice, for example, when we were talking about, he's showing all these, these, these Kemet um, and, and all these wares, the, the, the Egyptians used red and black for the same people. So both of these statues here are King Tut. In one statue, he's the Kim Black. In the other statue, he's Deshiret Red. So which one is his actual skin color? He can't be both. There's something else going on here. He showed Amenemhet, Amenhotep, 
This is another depiction of him. Same color like you see with um, uh, King Tut. Two different colors. We show the same thing with Taharka. Taharka here in a desperate red color. And then him is a, a pitch black, you know what I'm saying, in terms of the black off stone. What's going on here? Something else is going on. And so they not, they're not even thorough to even try to explain this in, in their um, presentations. And so I can go into Benin. This is from King Lele from the 1800s. This is him in the center. And these are his other people. They're using red and black also symbolically. These are not different people. So are, are, the, are the, uh, the, the Benin people, are they red people? I don't know if y'all been to Benin. What does this mean here? Same thing here. All from Benin. This has to do with the kingdom of Benin. And their representations. This is King Gale as a lion trampling his uh, enemies. And so these are all people. These are just all just other African people. But the, 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 the language is symbolic. I mean, the colors are symbolic. <laughs> Um, hold on, I'm trying to exit the full screen. Hold on, and, and go to this other, uh, this other, which one should I go to? See, hold on. See, I already showed that one in the presentation. And so, like, this here is from, well, first let me go here. So when he's talking about the feminine T, there's ways that we can, we, we can argue, there's ways that we can prove that not all T's are feminine. And that even the Egyptians got confused with the feminine T. And so here's the collagen. And so you have these verbs here, and these are cognates in the language. So the, in, in Egyptian, sir, sheep, seriate, a particular kind of sheep. In collagen, kishur, sheep, kishur yet, a sheep. Hawu, large, how it, large nest. U, wu, large. Uintu or indu, large nest. We see the same thing. And so this, these suffixes of abstract bring secondary meanings to adjectives and verbs and for